Um, this is an introduction to um, our Equilibria Diversity and Inclusion webinar. Um, you know, we have less than an hour. We have like 45 minutes. And so um, what can I really teach you um, to transform you in that time? So what I wanted to do was give you a taste of something that um, I was part of. I, I, when I joined Equilibria's team, I went to this session. I went to this workshop years ago. And um, I was blown away at what I didn't know. So um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more as we go on. I always introduce myself um, and this is a, you know, an introductory slide, except when I'm doing D&I, diversity and inclusion, um, I give a little more information about some of my pause and play opportunities as it relates to um, diversity and inclusion. So I am president of Equilibria in Sports and Equilibria in Education. I also founded my own company, True Brand Sports, you know, many years ago, but I've actually left it on the back burner because Equilibria is what I've spent my entire life looking for as a, an athlete. I played on the United States National Women's Water Polo Team for 10 years. I coached the team for a couple of years, 20 years coaching at Bucknell University, Division I men and women, was a collegiate athletic director. I was in baseball, vice president, general manager of a minor league baseball team. You know, I've had many, many leadership roles and many opportunities in life. But um, one of the things that we teach in equilibria is personal intervention. And if you were in my earlier session, you will know that that is a tool that we teach that helps you to manage those personality tendencies that could hold you back. So for me, I need to learn, I press pause to avoid interrupting and to give others a chance to voice their opinion. So I, my e-colors are yellow, red. I have a pause and play button. It's a tool. I wear it all the time and I push that pause and I push that play. So my yellow, as you see, the socializer part of my personality, I am yellow, red, so I do like to talk. My listening style, which I didn't know until I went through this, was my listening style is um, one where I'm listening to solve your problems or I could even interrupt you doesn't feel good. Doesn't feel good. Why isn't coach listening to me or my husband? You know, she's not listening to me. She's interrupting me. So I have to press pause to avoid interrupting and give others a chance to voice their opinions. Then I need to press play to focus on being a uh, generous listener. We'll talk about that. Uh, so I need to press play on learning, growing, and listening to understand bias in all of its dimensions. So Let's just jump into this. So our next, we've been doing, I've been doing, um, oh my gosh, I, we've been doing them for months, um, some free diversity and inclusion webinars um, with Garrett Jones. He's a black, former um, a black NFL football player from Houston, Texas. Garrett is actually in the running, hopefully, to be the next general manager of a professional football team. He's absolutely amazing. And Garrett and I have put, had this in the works a long time ago before the tragedies of the last eight, eight months, six months jumped in. And I gotta tell you, I kept thinking, you know, nobody wants to hear from a white woman. And um, during these, you know, really disturbing times. Um, and uh, Garrick is like, Lynn, you know, you have to be part of the solution, so let's go. So I was just blown away. So in our first webinar, um, what we do is we just raise awareness about the basics of diversity and inclusion. What does that mean? Um, both of us share a perspective. And so for different times, I always brought in, like I've, I've been coaching an inner city swim team and um, you know, most of my team doesn't even know how to swim when they come out for it. And I teach them how to swim. And, and I've, you know, I've got some incredible young women who um, come from very, very little. So I've had one or two of those introduce themselves and share their story instead of hearing from me. Um, but then the last couple of sessions, I'll, I'll share a little bit of my perspective. And then Garrick, you know, he's a six foot eight, huge black man. And he always shares that, you know, he's the image. He's the image, I'm so sorry. He's the image of what so many people take a step back. He just, just who he is and he's the most, incredible human being I've ever met, but he shares um, some pretty incredible uh, vulnerable stories. And then we start to understand biases and their roots. 
we educate ourselves about what micro inequities are, micro affirmations, and then we do use a lot of breakout rooms, lots and lots of breakout rooms. As you can see, I am an engager and I love to chat, but when people are especially online, I'm actually getting ready to fly to a place tomorrow where we're socially distancing and masks and we're doing this actual workshop um, on a full day retreat on Thursday. But anyhow, so we do move into breakout rooms. So people, you know, are sharing some pretty stories and we've been having these free. So you can imagine the diversity from all over the world, cultures, religions, um, races, um, sex. It's just been incredible. So, and then we prepare for the next one. So one of the things that I want to share with you, and I'm just going to put all this up because I love, this is Equilibria's um, d &I logo. And I just love it. Because the D and the I are in the same font sizes to represent the equal importance of diversity and inclusion. The D in the D and I has a double meaning. The D that represents diversity is intentionally lower cased to emphasize the importance of inclusion. Without inclusion, diversity would be short lived and the value of diversity is not fully appreciated. The and, which is also in E colors, the E color depiction in the D and the and symbol represent the diversity of thought and its dependence on inclusion. So I'll, I shared that a little bit earlier, but I will touch on that in a little bit. And then the I, the I obviously stands for inclusion, but it's the unique logo has again, a double meaning. The capital I represents the use of the word I and presumes that the act of including starts with me and you. And, um, and to set a more inclusive environment. So no one else, we, we have to be the ones that started. The white eye represents the absence of color. As our e-color tendencies are irrelevant, our personalities are irrelevant to our character. And if inclusion is truly um, important to us, intentional action must be taken to include others. So a little bit about my perspective that I didn't, you know, I haven't shared it a lot because um, race has been so prevalent um, and that issue and people want to get to that point. This is me coaching. I coached men at Bucknell University men's water polo. We were ranked in the country and um, I just love this picture. It takes me back. But one of the perspectives that I did share as because there's different dimensions of diversity. And so I shared my um, experience as a woman in sport. Right. Um, I graduated high school and college back in the 70s. Um, 1972, Title IX was established. And, um, and so, you know, it did give, when I was in high school, there were three opportunities for women. Now, fortunately, there's many more. But I do want to share with you that, you know, it was good until it wasn't with so many things. Think about civil rights, which we'll get into. So in 1994, colleges had come to a standstill. And many, you know, the whole Title IX wasn't being reached. So Congress passed um, a, this EADA report that requires institutions of higher education to track and disclose certain information relating to the participation of male and female students. And um, I will tell you, I won't even tell you how many schools aren't even close to being in compliance with Title IX all these years later. And so, you know, it's still an issue. Why are the women, why are the women, where are the women? Sorry, I'm being distracted by some technology. Um, where are the women? And, um, you know, back in the 70s, about 95% of coaches for women's sports at the collegiate level, high school level, were women. And um, I just want you 90%. And now what I want you to know is it's dropping each and every day. Um, it's below 40% at the collegiate level, and it's even less at the high school level. And what I share is that um, if they can't see us, they can't dream to be us. And so um, these are some women. So where are the women? An endless number of women have been fired for voicing their concerns about inequities and fighting for equality for their teams. Another dimension that I shared, I wasn't, I didn't share that. It might have been um, my last time I wanted to talk a little bit about racial bias. And um, again, you know, we've had civil rights movements back in the 50s and 60s, 60s 
for Black Americans to gain, you know, equal rights. And so I just share my perspective of, um, you know, uh, some things that have to do with race. And um, obviously, um, it's so much more impactful hearing from Garrick, my co-partner. But one of the things that uh, I wanted to share was a little bit about John Lewis. But I also wanted to share how I've moved forward. So I was in 1968, right? I was, uh, I was in middle school, high school. And um, 68, where was I? Uh, yeah, I was in grade school, middle school. And I remember during the Olympic ceremony, I remember Tommy Smith and John Carlos because I was an athlete. It is what I lived for back in the day when lots of women weren't. When they raised their black gloved fists during the playing of the national anthem. Um, and I remember being angry just being very vulnerable here. I remember being angry and um, because lack of information, what I didn't know, I was a middle schooler, maybe, you know, and, um, but then remember in 2016, it, you know, um, Kaepernick, right? Opted to kneel during the national anthem. And it has been a controversy since then, but I wasn't angry. I wasn't angry. Obviously I was at a much deeper place in life, but I, I wanted to understand. I wanted to understand why he did that. I was never angry. I wanted to understand, which I did. And so again, I just shared some of the, you know, I would say murders that have happened and um, just what have I been doing to, um, to increase my knowledge. Everywhere I, I'm listening to podcasts, I've reread books. Um, I've downloaded every one of these books and I am trying to be better informed as a, as a white American. So John Lewis, I do live in Maryland. He passed away this year. I used to live uh, at right Notre Dame, Indiana. My husband worked for the university and I can't tell you how many times I've said to myself, gosh, I wish I was there when someone was being honored. And because I was just an hour and a half away, I went to honor this man who's been a hero and a legend for me. So I just shared that a little bit because I think that vulnerability helps to set us up. But I do want to take you back to the eight essentials of a high performance team and eight essentials of a high performance culture. It doesn't start with diversity and inclusion. It starts with self and team awareness and having a huge understanding of how you what your strengths are, what things about your personality could hold you back. Are you too quick? Do you not give enough information? Um, so many things that are so invaluable. It's one of our driving elements, being on the same page, sharing a mission and vision that everybody in that team at that moment defines. Not something that's on the wall and nobody has seen. You know, all of our companies, all of our uh, boards have shared missions and visions that have been written forever, but do you create that new one every year that falls in line with the long-term mission and vision, but everybody can see themselves in that. And diversity and inclusion needs to be part of that mission, vision, and values. So now the next driver is, right, clarity of roles. Everybody understanding their roles and there's clarity about the processes. Only when you have those three driving elements in place, and then you move on to trust, how you create trust. It's different for all of us, depending on your personality style. It's amazing. Only when you have those in place, can you really hope to impact diversity and inclusion? You know, I'm looking everywhere. There's diversity and inclusion training everywhere. And I've been through so much over my lifetime. And does it really make a difference? Does it make a difference if you haven't got those elements in place. So we need to do those before we can do diversity and inclusion. We've actually been jumping in and doing diversity and inclusion. So diversity is a fact, inclusion is an act. So we do, we give some brief examples, definitions of what everything is. What is a diverse culture, right? The presence of differences that make each person unique that can be used to differentiate, differentiate groups from one another. So one of the things that I introduced earlier this morning in our self and team awareness is we use an iceberg and above the waterline, the smaller part of that iceberg is our personality. 
And below the waterline is our character, the much bigger part. So I want you to think we usually do interactive stuff, um, but I don't think I don't think we have the capability. Sorry, I have something in my eye. But we ask, you know, those are all the different personality styles there along the waterline. So think about that in your team, on your board, in your office, in your family. What are the visible dimensions of diversity? What are those things that you see? Visible dimensions of diversity. And then what are the in invisible dimensions of diversity? You know, it's not just one dimension. So we give people a time to really dig deep and answer this question. And again, age, race, gender, culture, disability, religion, nationality, those are some of the visible diversity of dimensions. But way underneath that, that are even more important is family background, upbringing, disability, life experiences, skills, expertise, values, career background, education. I'm, I'm mentoring, I mentor tons of people and I'm mentoring a coach right now who is just filled with anger um, and it's coming out on the playing fields. And I literally asked him, where does this anger come from? And no one had ever asked him that before. And it came from his upbringing, family background, something that we don't see. And people were judging him on his anger and just, it's just powerful. So we just get that and then we get into inclusion. What does inclusion really mean? And um, one thing that I'll tell you, I'm really passionate about this generation. I'm passionate about lots of things, but bullying. I do lots of workshops on bullying around the world. But a lot of people think that um, cyberbullying is the biggest form of bullying today. And it's actually inclusion, um, exclusion, right? People thinking they're better than you. I just had this great privilege. I was in Michigan City um, earlier last week doing a um, self and team awareness workshop for uh, sixth, seventh, eighth graders from a um, you know, a very poor background and great diversity in the class. It just, it was just incredible. And standing up in front of them and saying, nobody is better than you. Nobody is better than you when everything around them tells them everybody else is better than them. And I can come in and do that. And, um, and no one is better than them. I might have better opportunities. You may have better opportunities. Somebody in your class is better in math. Somebody may have a bigger, bigger home but that doesn't mean that they are a better person than you. And this is what we've got to be, you know, teaching all the time and, and helping. And so inclusion, right? Exclusion is the biggest form of bullying, whether it's in the office, whether it's in the boardroom, whether it's on a team. And so we talk about what is inclusion, but what is holding us back from diversity and inclusion? So I want you to realize, right? It's unconscious bias or implicit bias. We all have it. And I think, for a lot of white people to do this deep down work and think about it, you immediately think, I, I, you know, you don't wanna talk about it because does, does it look like I'm not a good person? And that's not it at all. Great people from all dimensions of diversity have unconscious bias because we all do, we all have it. So we do share, you know, we get into what all of these are. What is an unconscious bias? We all have it. Um, different types, different types. What I want to point out here is unconscious bias does not necessarily align with our declared beliefs or even reflect stances we would explicitly endorse. So we may think, oh my gosh, I totally disagree with that. That is not who I am. But then we might make decisions based on unconscious bias that we're not aware of. It's just amazing. So I'm gonna ask you this question. I want you to think about it. I'm gonna let it sit with you. What percentage of decisions are made with implicit unconscious bias on your boards, on your teams, in the business area, in, in the business setting, doesn't matter. What percentage? So you can Google this and the answer is 93 to 98% is really what you see of decisions that are made are made with unconscious bias. Wow, sit with that for a second. And I will share, because I know there's a lot of boards that are at this conference. One of the lowest, um, you know, one of the places where there's such a uh, very undiverse 
boards is um, is in boards. Not a lot of diversity on boards. So implicit unconscious bias, all different types. I'll tell you, there are about 30 different types. You know, perception bias, all members of a class have the same tendencies. So I was on a panel last night and one of my co-presenters, who is a wonderful man, I just met him, was talking about millennials and he kept saying, all of them, all of them. And I interrupted him and said, please, we, we can't put them all in the same, that's perception bias. Affinity bias, right? People have a tendency to hire, develop and support people like them. Why are there less than 40% of women coaching at the collegiate level and even less women of um, diversity? Because many of those powerful decisions are held by men, are held by men. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but, but affinity bias absolutely is going on. The halo effect. You like someone and are biased to think everything they do is good. My child is never going to mess up. Happening all the time. Confirmation bias, right? We agree with people who agree with us. Oh my gosh, we need to surround ourselves with people who challenge us and don't agree with us. And then we ask why. And then social comparison bias. We favor people in our group. Man, oh man, we've got to work with our kids. So we do do some work with micro inequities and I've had people say they've never heard of this. So what are micro inequities, right? They're small ways in which we see bias at work. They're disrespectful actions that are sometimes so subtle, they leave the targets wondering if they were really slighted or are just being overly sensitive. So I want you to think about my personality, things that I've shared is I could be too talkative. I wasn't a good listener. I can lose focus. Well, think. If I'm a predominant, if I am the dominant um, culture that is in a room and I'm speaking to someone who's not part of that dominant culture, just my personality actions are my grown equities, but they might be interpreting that is, ah, this is because of my faith. This is because of my color. So we want to be aware of this. Some examples, the leader says good morning to everyone, but one person. A manager repeatedly ignores the existence of a colleague in the elevator. This happens all the time. A group of employees goes out for coffee or drinks after work and they leave out one person. They're just not good enough. Wow, we've got to stop that exclusion. Introducing one colleague with glowing accolades and the other with just a name. That's happened to me. That has happened to me. I was a keynote speaker with a man um, at a conference. I'll never forget it, it was in Bangkok. And my bio, my accomplishments far exceeded this other man. He was just younger, didn't have the experience that I had. He was amazing. But the guy that introduced him, you would have thought he was the beginning of, of the new world. And, um, and when it was turned to introduce me, absolutely shied away from my accomplishments. And many people in the room were upset. And I got to tell you, it was kind of a gut check for me. Pecking away at a smartphone while someone is trying to have an important conversation with you. I will share with you with my research that whether you have your phone facing up or your phone facing down and you're having a conversation with someone, it screams at them, you're just not that important. So many of us are addicted to our phones. Think about what our children are watching. Leaving someone out of social engagement. So micro affirmations, micro affirmations. And again, we talk about this. We go into a room and people share in small groups, micro inequities that they have experienced. And if you have time as a woman coaching men, reach out to me and I will give you your own special workshop on micro inequities. Micro affirmations, think about this, small gestures, big impact. Microaffirmations are small and subtle acknowledgements of a person's value, ability, or accomplishments. I'm so sorry. I hate, hate me just being the voice, but this wasn't really set up to be interactive. They may take the form of private or public recognition or simply polite and respectful behaviors. They form the basis of successful relationships and lead to greater self-esteem and improved performance and productivity. You want to impact your culture? You need to understand micro affirmations and micro inequities and bias. So some examples, generous listening. They pay attention, ask questions for clarification, 
make eye contact, turns away from their computer or phone when speaking to you, listen to understand, no distractions, writes down key points that you're saying, and we lean in. I already shared that I was not an effective listener and I didn't know. I didn't know. I just, I knew I, ha I know I have good character. I know I'm a highly successful coach and leader did not know that I was not an effective listener. I was not a generous listener, let alone, let alone an abundant listener. Think about this level, listening with open body language, listening for possibility, listening to forward the action, listening to what you are committed to, listening with curiosity. Oh my gosh, curiosity. Listening for the most rewarding interpretation, listening to understand, and then seek to, under, to be understood. Two high levels of listening. So this young man, Charles, works as an intern for the sports organization and Roy, who's putting this on, he has given me permission to share this with you. Charles was in one of our DNI sessions. After the end of the first session, this came at the second day and we had formed, he had built some trust with us by this point. So I came into his breakout room and I just felt like I needed to record what he had to say. So he's a 20 year old, 22 year old, recent college grad, absolutely captivating human being, but he is sharing what his life, what he has to think about before he leaves his apartment as a 22 year old black man in our culture today. Really powerful. I can only imagine uh, Andre feels that for me, it's like, wow. I have to every single day, I got to have hope. So every single day, I have to say to myself, before I go out, okay, grab my ID. Okay, grab my keys. Okay, make sure you don't wear a hood. You know what I'm saying? So like, the fact that you have to live life like that, and I don't want to be traffic about it, but like, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a slave. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm just, this isn't the 20s. This isn't the 40s. This isn't the 50s. This is 2020. By 2020, I was, I was supposed to be, we were supposed to all be equal. So, um, you know, that is, it's still frustrating. Um, but I will say this, I will tell you this. So I want you to think, you know, that, that video could anger some people, but were you listening abundantly to understand where he was coming from? Where he was coming from? Absolutely incredible. So our second webinar is, um, we're actually, this time we're actually gonna do this. We haven't done this, we've always done it in two. This one's gonna be in three because I 100% believe and know that you need to understand as much as you can about your personality, your strengths, your potential limiters, how you listen, how you speak, what are all those tendencies? So we're actually gonna do what I charge you know, money for, we're gonna do it for free. Um, again, it's not gonna be the longest version, but we're going to do in the second webinar, um, self and team awareness, the first essential. And because I think that it will really offer um, some amazing insight into diversity and inclusion. So now I'm just gonna move to the third session. What are we going to do? How do we bring this home? So after that, we're going to define the meaning of psychological safety. If you don't know what that is, you need to look at it. You need to understand, does everybody on your team feel psychological safety? Discuss and share what you need for psychological safety. How can your personality get in the way of building a diverse and inclusion, inclusive environment? And discuss some play and pause applications um, and how that play and pause can come into your life as a, a leader for DNI. Anyhow, so we talk about what is psychological safety, right? Psychological safety is a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. It's, I want you also to think if you've read the book Cast, they talk a lot about the dominant um, dimension of diversity versus the non-dominant dimension of diversity. And I want you to know, it is not the non-dominant responsibility to teach us about diversity and inclusion. There is no psychological safety 
in going to that one black person, that one Hispanic person, the woman in the room, and I have been the only woman in the room 95% of my career, or the one person from a different faith. It's not their responsibility to educate us on diversity and inclusion. So I want you to understand that. In 2015, um, you know, Google published the results of a two-year study into what makes a great team. And again, I think it's those eight essentials, but you can't get to psychological safety unless you've gone through, it just doesn't happen. I think you need essential one, essential two, essential three, then you need trust. And then you can get, you can, you're starting to build psychological safety. So the results were clear that the number one factor in creating a successful team, and I'm talking about an athletic team, a board, a business team, within your family. I don't think this is new information for any of you, creating psychological safety. So I just want you to think of, of this scenario. This is what we, we are, this is a new session. I want you to think of a time where you are joining an organization or a team. The dominant culture is not you. So whoever's on this call, I can't see you. The dominant culture is not you. I want you to think about this in terms of any dimension of diversity. So maybe you're the only woman in the room. Maybe you're the only Asian in the room. It could be race, gender, religion, disability, doesn't matter. So I want you to be that person right now. What would you need so that you feel psychological safety on your first day with a new team or work environment? Can you have enough empathy to put yourself in those shoes. How would you want this team to welcome you? How would you want them to recognize you? Is there anything else they could do to make you feel part of the team? Wow. How many of you are not asking this of new people coming onto your team, whether they are the dominant culture or not, but even more so if they're not? Amazing power. So we go into breakout rooms and we talk about this. Here's another huge thing. We're going to move into breakout rooms. And again, I know all their e-colors because they've done that. And they're in breakout rooms, first with their own e-colors, people that share their personality, and then they get mixed up. So I want you to think about, think about this right now. Has anyone ever asked you this question? When it comes to diversity and inclusion, so often we're lectured to, okay, it's over and we've checked off a box. I do not believe in checking off boxes. I believe we have to live the experience. How do I leverage my strengths to build DNI? How do I leverage my strengths to build DNI? So my so my strengths are I'm passionate. I love to coach. I love to connect people. I'm going to connect with whoever that is. How do I manage my potential limiters? so they do not tear down DNI. I could be that person. Maybe I go to lunch with a group and we've included this new non-dominant diversity person and I dominate the conversation. I'm too loud. I'm too much. How does that person take it? How does that person take it? So I have to manage my potential limiters so they don't unintentionally or not tear down diversity and inclusion. How are my e-colors getting in the way? How is my personality getting in the way of diversity and inclusion? This is the kind of work we need to bring into our homes, into our teams, into our work environment, not checking off a box with a lecture. Real, real live discussions. So we have this incredible matrix um, it's the inclusion matrix. So look at from the top, diversity, inclusion, unconscious bias, micro inequities. And then it's based on personality styles. So I've already shared earlier that red's information filter is what is it? So what is it from a view of a red personality? Why is it relevant? Blue, e-colors, their information filter is why? Why is this important? Yellow's information filter is who? Who does this involve, right? So look at diversity under yellow. Everyone, all leaders, supervisor, and employees in our company are gonna embrace leveraging diversity and, and, and inclusion 
and it starts with me. How does it help us? Greens, those of you who are top greens, who are really organizers and analytical, greens want to know how does it help us succeed? Man, everything about equilibria is about diversity and inclusion, whether it's thoughts, whether it's culture, whatever dimension it is, we can never reach our potential as an organization or a team unless we embrace the diversity factor that every single person brings to our community. So this is a really powerful document that we share and we actually give it to people in our workshop. So real quick questions. Let's see how you do. We got plenty of time here. Implicit unconscious bias is a rare phenomenon. False. 93 to 98% of decisions that are made are made with unconscious bias. Where do you fall into that? What work have you done to reveal those unconscious biases? Smiling at someone can be a micro affirmation. Absolutely, absolutely. And do you know that some of our personality styles don't smile? You know, there are some personalities that naturally Smiling doesn't come natural. It's not one of their top strengths. It doesn't mean that they can't smile. For instance, I, I've been mentoring, I've been coaching a division one swimmer. She was ranked in the top five in the world last year at her college. And um, her personality is green blue. So she's a deep thinker and she's also shy. Top recruit to her team and their nickname to her, they called her oatmeal. And I asked her, I said, what, what is oatmeal? And they said, plain. And I just thought, wow, here she is. How did that feel welcoming? Nothing about that felt welcoming. So what did we do this summer? I worked with her on the strengths of a yellow, which is passionate, animated, smiling. Believe it or not, she's gone back to school and she's never been happier and smiling, right? It takes 21 days to even potentially change a habit. We worked all summer. And so now people see her and they don't think, you know, think about people thought she was oatmeal because of her personality, not her character, that exclusion piece. So smiling. Micro inequities are subtle behaviors that are sometimes hard to detect. Absolutely true. Think about yourself. How does that play out for you as a leader? It's difficult and time consuming to perform micro affirmations. Oh my gosh, it's the simplest thing we can do each and every day. One way to counteract implicit unconscious bias is with micro affirmations. It's true, but we've got to do the work to uncover the unconscious bias and we've got to do the work Unconscious bias positively impacts productivity in the workplace. Absolutely not. So every one of your environments has implicit bias happening because you're human. You're human. It doesn't make you bad. What makes you not have the character that you want to have is when you don't do the deep work, not only as an individual, but as a team to bring these out, which normally between our first and second webinar, everyone gets this pretty powerful homework assignment. So I just wanna share with you that everyone has biases, keep it all in perspective. We're designed to have them. Understand that the intent of raising awareness around diversity and inclusion is just that, to be aware and not to have everyone walking around on eggshells and eggshells happen. I've been in that environment. Treating people with respect and dignity should be a key aspect of who we are as human beings. I shared this earlier and I, I really, um, I try to live this. My CEO was doing a workshop and I was um, participating and he shared this statement, do you leave everyone with their dignity? And I didn't, I wish I knew, you know, I wish I knew back when I was growing up, when I was in college, when I was in my thirties, when I was a mom, I'm a mom of three kids who are all young adults. I wish I knew then what I know now because I would have managed my personality so differently. And I can think of so many times that I didn't leave someone with their dignity. 
Um, and I'm not talking about screaming and being crazy. I was never that kind of coach, but some things about my personality style made people feel disrespected. And I didn't even know that. Listen to yourself is a great way to start. Understanding your own personality tendencies as well as those around you is your very next step. So reach out to me, um, get involved. So this is one of our flyers and I can send this to you. Um, our next free diversity and inclusion webinar series is, and again, usually it's just two nights, but the power of the self and team awareness workshop, and we're giving this away, it is free. So Monday, November 9th, it's eight to 9.30 PM Eastern standard time. So for Chicago, it's 7 to 8.30 p.m. It's 90 minutes. And it is, you don't want to turn your Zoom off. It's that powerful. Thursday, November 12th, that's when we're going to do self and team awareness. That is a paid workshop, but I'm giving it away for free. Absolutely life-changing. And then we'll finish up on Monday, November 16th, 8 to 9.30 p.m. Again, that will be D&I part two. I know we're all busy. I know we're all burnt out. I promise you, at the end of this, you will be, when can you come to my team? When can you come to my board? It's a, it's a little long, but it's definitely worth watching. So I just wanna thank you um, very much. And um, there's my contact information and you should be able to get it from Roy. But again, I'm just gonna leave this up. If you have any interest, if you wanna invite anybody, um, it's a free DNI. Um, webinar series. It is incredible. We do ask that you participate in all three. So it is a commitment, but you really build relationships so that by that third session, um, it's, it's, it's easy for people to trust each other. So anyhow, I don't know if there's any questions or if there's even anybody still on. <laughs> If nothing goes in the chat box, no questions, I will let you go and um, enjoy the final night of the conference. And um, thank you so much for, for joining me.